Hello everyone, we are starting chapter 10, which is about rotation of a rigid object, specifically about a fixed axis. Um, before we, I guess, talk first about rotation around um, a fixed axis, let's first just redefine a rigid object. So we would just say a rigid object is something that is non-deformable. So remember that um, maybe what I push on one part of a system, that's going to happen to the entire system. But a deformable object, so remember, go back and think about the balloon, um, where we push in on both sides of, if we push in on a balloon, um, the sides that we're pushing in on are going to have some type of, of displacement, but if I'm thinking about the center of that balloon, it doesn't go through any type of displacement. So that would be a deformable type of object. Now, all real objects are deformable to some, to some extent, um, but we are just going to assume that all of our objects for this chapter are going to be non-deformable, or otherwise we will just call them rigid. Okay, so all of these things to so far in um, the first couple sections of this chapter are pretty much review. We're just now, instead of thinking about, um, we're thinking about now in terms of, of circular motion, in terms of maybe radians is another way that we can think about it. So angular position. Um, if I have, let's say we have a disc that could rotate. So this disc that could rotate, um, Maybe I just pick some reference point, and we're going to call that reference point here P. Now, its axis of rotation is just here in the middle of this disk, so ultimately then the disk can just rotate. So let's say that I'm just going to pick a point P. This point P that I've chosen just arbitrarily, I'm going to say that this then is just going to be my reference line. Um, and let's say that the disk is going to then rotate counterclockwise. So in some time, the disc uh, point is, as the disc is rotating, point P is then going to move or shift over, specifically a, a distance R from the origin. So I have an angle, a position is what we'll call this, that P has moved. Um, R is just going to represent um, that radius or that length that it's moved from then that reference line. And S is something that we've probably seen, we've probably seen all of this before. S is what we'll call arc length. So S here, let's get a new color. S here is just arc length. Okay, so point P is going to have some um, coordinate, and we're going to say that that coordinate is going to be R theta. And we're just saying that r is just the distance from the origin to p, and then theta is just going to be um, that position that's measured counterclockwise from that reference line. Um, we could measure arc length, this s here, by the following formula, s equals theta, I don't know that we can see that perfectly, so s equals theta times r. So arc length and, and r and theta are all related by this equation here. Um, I could also then rearrange that if I wanted to say what is theta equal to. Theta would just be equal to my arc length then over that distance from the origin to where my arbitrary point here is that we chose for, for the disk. Okay, which is just right here. So I could also think about something in terms of theta. Now theta for us is just representing a position. Um, and specifically, we just call it angular position, so that's why we just represent it as theta. So theta is just arc length over then that position from the origin to where we are. If we're talking about angular position or anything in this chapter, we always want our calculators to be now in radians. So if we want to compare degrees to radians or... Um, we should already know... I think we should know this too. So these things, guys, you've seen in math. I'm not going to spend time on them. Um, again, if we're still thinking about angular position, we associate theta so that um, we associate theta as being the angular position. So 
angle theta for an entire rigid object, I'm going to associate it even with just individual particles with that object. Because every particle within a rigid object is going to ro uh, rotate through that same angle. So we're just assuming that I could pick one point to represent the entire object, and um, I know that all of the particles in that object are going to move the same way because I can think about a rigid object as being just uniform. So angular position of the rigid object is just our angle theta. And that theta we just saw was just this here between my reference line and then between that position here, r. Okay, usually our fixed reference axis is usually on the x-axis. So I, I chose this just because it's usually easiest for us. And then if we're just thinking about our coordinate system for a circle, we're always going to move counterclockwise because that's just what we're used to also in math. Okay, angular displacement. So if angular position is represented by theta, then displacement is just going to be my final position minus my initial position. So it should make sense then that displacement would be change in theta. And change in theta is final minus initial. So um, at first, I may have been right here at this point. So my initial theta here is just this particular angle here. And then at B, I've now gone all the way this way, so my theta F would be right here. My final theta would be here. So all this is showing us is that the angle that the reference line is sweeping through um, to get to that final position. Just like we have displacement, if we're talking about linear motion, um, we also can think about average speed or instantaneous speed for angular motion. So we know that in terms of our linear motion, that change in speed is just my distance over time. So if I'm talking about my average angular speed, it's still the same thing. I have my angular position, which is just my um, final theta minus my initial theta, in a time interval. So if we took the derivative of our um, change in position and change in time, ultimately we're also going to get our average angular speed. So angular speed is designated by the lowercase Greek letter omega. So omega is representing our average angular speed, and that's just my angular position over time, which in linear terms I would have um, just my speed, or v, is equal to my change in distance over, over change in time. So same thing here. Um, so average speed, I'm thinking about delta theta over delta t. And then if I'm talking about instantaneous angular speed, that's where I'm going to use my derivative here. Because ultimately, the time interval will approach 0, so I can use a derivative. Acceleration is the exact same way. Acceleration, we're going to symbolize with alpha for angular acceleration. Um, just like we know in linear terms that acceleration is equal to velocity, change in velocity over change in time, um, angular acceleration is the same thing. Angular acceleration is going to be equal to your angular velocity over your change in time. So my alpha, uh, average alpha is going to equal delta omega over delta t. If I'm talking about instantaneous angular acceleration, that means my, I want my time interval ultimately as time goes to zero. If I took the derivative of that, that will give me my instantaneous one. The difficult part about talking about rotation then um, is mostly just talking about direction. So we use something that's called the right hand rule. Um, so for the right hand rule, we can see this. And actually, let's come back to this one tomorrow in class. We'll do the right hand rule together tomorrow. Um, I'll do one more slide and then we'll, we'll call it good today. So we had linear, we had linear kinematic equations if we're talking about for translational motion, so um, just by straight line motion. 
but now I also can have rotational kinematic equations. Madison and Jasmine Roberts to the office. Madison They are and exactly the same thing. The only difference between them is just what the symbols are representing. So this table 10.1 in your book does a really good job of showing or at least comparing them. So I have final velocity equals initial plus acceleration times time. It's the same thing here. My final angular speed equals my initial angular speed plus angular acceleration times time. So all of these should be equivalent to one another. They just have new symbols. And just in case you're wondering what those symbols should sub in for, I wrote them here for you guys. Um, okay, so we're going to do practice problems tomorrow in class with the rotational kinematic equations with finding angular acceleration, angular speed, um, angular position, all that good stuff. So please remember your lab reports are due if you, tomorrow. If you have any questions, um, email me, let me know. And if not, I will see you tomorrow. Have a wonderful night, guys. Bye.